<laughs> I found my book. I found it. I found my glasses. I found all the things. I, uh, yeah. Had a little bit of trouble, but I still, uh, I still made it. I'll figure out where I am. Okay, we read that one. Ah, J.G. Ballard's story is the second story in here. Hi, welcome. Hope you can hear me okay. I definitely had a delay getting here. I was literally just reading about this guy. Hi, welcome. Okay, that's a new story. of space, time, and the river. It's going to be after that. And then we could probably read just in a row here. Out of my head, James Gunn, a work of art, James Blish. Oh, and wood. Let's see if we can get all the way That's kind of a lot. Let's see how many we can get through. Hi, Krista. Ah. Come see, come so. Et tu? Comment ça va? Tardy today. Here we go. Hi, welcome. Let's get started, shall we? This is part two, and I only read the two stories last time, but I read, I read the longest story in the book. Bien, bien. Okay, so this is interesting because um, I know probably nobody cares about the Met Gala theme, but I was just learning about it, and it is based on, the costume theme this year is based on um, Garden of Time, which I believe is J.G. Ballard, pretty sure, yeah because he did Empire of the Sun in 1984. Um, anyway, so I was just reading this Garden of Time story. So now we get to read a uh, Time of Passage.
sunlight spilled among the flowers and tombstones, turning the cemetery into a bright garden of sculpture. Like two large gaunt crows, the grave diggers leaned on their spades between marble angels, their shadows arching across the smooth white flank of one of the recent graves. The gilt lettering was still fresh and untarnished. James Falkman, 1963 to 1901. The end is but the beginning. Leisurely, they began to pare back the crisp turf, then dismantle the headstone and swathed it in a canvas sheet, laying it behind the graves in the next aisle. Biddle, the older of the two, a lean man in a black waistcoat, pointed to the cemetery gates, where the first morning party approached. Hi, Michael. They're here. Let's get our backs into it. The younger man, Biddle's son, watched the small procession winding through the graves. His nostrils scented the sweet broken earth. They're always early, he murmured reflectively. It's a strange thing. You never see them come on time. A clock tolled from the chapel among the cypresses. Working swiftly, they scooped out the soft earth, pilling it, piling it into a neat cone at the grave's head. A few minutes later, when the sexton arrived, with the principal mourners, the polished teak of the coffin was exposed. And Biddle jumped down onto the lid and scraped away the damp earth clinging to its brass rim. The ceremony was brief and the 20 mourners, led by Falkman's sister, a tall white-haired woman with a narrow autocratic face, leaning on her husband's arm, soon returned to the chapel. Biddle gestured to his son, they jerked the coffin out of the ground and loaded it onto a cart, strapping it down under the harness. Then they heaped the earth back into the grave and relayed the squares of turf. As they pushed the cart back to the chapel, the sunlight shone brightly among the thinning graves. 48 hours later, the coffin arrived at James Falkman's large gray stone house on the upper slopes of Mont Montmere Park. The high walled avenue was almost deserted and the few people saw the hearse enter. Oh, and few people saw that. Okay, let's try that again. The high walled avenue was almost deserted and few people saw the hearse enter the tree line drive. The blinds were drawn over the windows and huge wreaths rested among the furniture in the hall where Falkman lay motionless in his coffin on a mahogany table. Veiled by the dim light, his square, strong-jawed face seemed composed and unblemished, a short lock of hair over its forehead, making his expression less severe than his sister's. A solitary beam of sunlight, finding its way through the dark sycamores which guarded the house, slowly traversed the room as the morning progressed and shone for a few minutes upon Falkman's open eyes. Even after the beam had moved away, a faint glimmer of light still remained in the pupils, like the reflection of a star glimpsed in the bottom of a dark well. All day, helped by two of her friends, sharp-faced women in long black coats, Falkman's sister moved quietly about the house. Her quick, deft hands shook the dust from the velvet curtains in the library, wound the miniature Louis the Fifteenth clock on the study desk, and reset the great barometer on the staircase. None of the women spoke to each other, but within a few hours, the house was transformed the dark wood in the hall gleaming as the first callers were admitted. Mr. and Mrs. Montefiore, Mr. and Mrs. Caldwell, Miss Evelyn German and Miss Elizabeth, 
Mr. Samuel Banbury. One by one, nodding in acknowledgement as they were announced, the callers trooped into the hall and paused over the coffin, examining Falkman's face with discreet interest, then passed into the dining room, where they were presented with a glass of port and a tray of sweetmeats. Most of them were elderly, overdressed in the warm spring weather, one or two obviously ill at ease in the great oak-paneled house, and all unmistakably revealed the same air of hushed, expectancy. Hi, welcome. The following morning, Falkman was lifted from his coffin and carried upstairs to the bedroom overlooking the drive. The winding sheet was removed from his frail body, dressed in a pair of thick woolen pajamas. He lay quietly between the cold sheets, his gray face sightless and reposed, unaware of his sister crying softly on the high back chair beside him. Only when Dr. Markham called and put his hand on her shoulder did she contain herself, relieved to have given way to her feelings. Almost as if this were a signal, Falkman opened his eyes. For a moment, they wavered uncertainly, the pupils weak and watery. Then he gazed up at his sister's tear-marked face, his head motionless on the pillow. As she and the doctor leaned forward, Falkman smiled fleetingly, his lips parting across his teeth in, in an expression of immense patience and understanding. Then, apparently exhausted, he lapsed into a deep sleep. After securing the blinds over the windows, his sister and the doctor stepped from the room. Below the doors closed quietly into the drive and the house became silent. Gradually, the sounds of Falkman's breathing grew more steady and filled the bedroom, overlaid by the swaying of the dark trees outside. So James Falkman made his arrival. For the next week, he lay quietly in his bedroom, his strength increasing hourly, and managed to eat his first meals prepared by his sister. She sat in the blackwood chair, her morning habit exchanged for a gray woolen dress, examining him critically. Now, James, you'll have to get a better appetite than that. Your poor body is completely wasted. Falkman pushed away the tray and let his long, slim hands fall across his chest. He smiled amiably at his sister. Careful, Betty, or you'll turn me into a milk pudding. His sister briskly straightened the eider down. If you don't like my cooking, James, you can fend for yourself. A faint chuckle slipped between Falkman's lips. Thank you for telling me, Betty. I fully intend to. He lay back smiling weakly to himself as his sister stalked out of the tr without, with the tray. Teasing her did him almost as much good as the meal she prepared, and he felt the blood reaching down into his cold feet. His face was still gray and flaccid, and he conserved his strength carefully, only his eyes moving as he watched the ravens alighting on the window ledge. Gradually, as his conversations with his sister became more frequent, Falkman gained sufficient strength to sit up. He began to take a fuller interest in the world around him, watching the people in the avenue through the French windows and disputing his sister's commentary on them. There's Sam Banbury again, she remarked testily at the small leprechaun-like old man hobble hobbled past. Off to the swan as usual. When's he going to get a job, I'd like to know. Be more charitable, Betty. Sam's a very sensible fellow. I'd rather go to the pub than have a job. His sister snorted skeptically, her assessment of Falkman's character apparently at variance with this statement. You've got one of the finest houses in Montmere Park. Montmere Park, she told him. I think you should not. You, I think you should be more careful with people like Sam Banbury. He's not in your class, James. 
Hoffman smiled patiently at his sister. We're all in the same class, or have you been here so long you've forgotten, Betty? We all forget, she told him soberly. You will too, James. It's sad, but we're in this world now, and we must concern ourselves with it. If the church can keep the memory alive for us, so much the better. As you'll find out, though, the majority of folk remember nothing. Perhaps it's a good thing. She grudgingly admitted the first visitors, fussing about so that Falkman could barely exchange a word with them. In fact, the visits tired him, and he could do little more than pass a few formal pleasantries. Even when Sam Banbury brought him a pipe and tobacco pouch, he had to muster all his energy to thank him, and had none left to prevent his sister from making off with them. Only when the Reverend Matthews called did Falkman manage to summon together his strength. For half an hour spoke earnestly to the person, who listened with rapt attention, interjecting a few eager questions. When the Reverend left, he seemed refreshed and confident and strode down the stairs with a gay smile at Falkman's sister. Within three weeks, Falkman was out of bed and managed to hobble downstairs and inspect the house and garden. His sister protested, dogging his slow, painful footsteps with sharp reminders of his feebleness, but Falkman ignored her. He found his way to the conservatory and leaned against one of the ornamental columns, his nervous fingers feeling the leaves of the miniature trees, the scent of flowers flushing his face. Outside in the grounds, he examined everything around him, as if comparing it with some Elysian paradise in his mind. He was walking back to the house when he twisted his ankle sharply in the crazy paving. Before he could cry for help, he had fallen headlong across the hard stones. James Falkman, will you never listen, his sister protested as she helped him across the terrace. I warned you to stay in bed. Reaching the lounge, Falkman sat down thankfully in an armchair, reassembling his stunned limbs. Quiet Betty, do you mind? He admonished his sister what when his breath returned. I'm still here, and I'm perfectly well. He had stated no more than the truth. After the accident, he began to recover spectacularly, his progress toward complete health accelerating without a break, as if the tumble had freed him from the lingering fatigue and discomfort of the previous weeks. His step became brisk and lively, his complexion brightened, a soft pink glow filling out his cheeks, and he moved busily around the house. A month afterward, his sister returned to her own home, acknowledging his ability to look after himself, and her place was taken by the housekeeper. After reestablishing himself in the house, Falkman became increasingly interested in the world outside. He hired a comfortable car and chauffeur, and spent most of the winter afternoons and evenings at his club. Soon he found himself the center of a wide circle of acquaintances. He became the chairman of a number of charitable committees, where his good humor, tolerance, and shrewd judgment made him well respected. He now held himself erect, his gray hair sprouting luxuriantly. Here and there, touched by black flecks, jaw jutting firmly from the suntan cheeks. Every Sunday, he attended the morning and evening services at his church, where he owned a private pew, and was somewhat saddened to see that only the older people formed the congregation. However, he himself found that the picture painted by the liturgy became increasingly detached from his own memories of, as the latter faded. Too soon became a meaningless charade that he could only accept by an act of faith. A few years later, when he became increasingly restless, he decided to accept the offer of a partnership in a leading firm of stockbrokers. Many of his acquaintances at the club were also finding jobs, forsaking the placid routines of smoking room and conservatory garden. Harold Caldwell, one of his closest friends, was appointed professor of history at the university, and Sam Banbury became a manager of the Swan Hotel. The ceremonial, 
on Falkman's first day as the stock exchange was dignified and impressive. Three junior men also joining the firm were introduced as the assembled staff by the senior partner, Mr. Montefiore, and each presented with a gold watch to symbolize the years he would spend with the firm. Falkman received an embossed silver cigar case and was loudly applauded. For the next five years, Falkman threw himself wholeheartedly into his work, growing more extrovert and aggressive as his appetite for the material pleasures of life increased. He became a keen golfer, then, as the exercise strengthened his physique, played his first games of tennis. An influential member of the business community, his days passed in a pleasant round of conferences and dinner parties. He no longer attended the church, but instead spent his Sundays escorting the more attractive of his lady acquaintances to the racetracks and regattas. He found it all the more surprising, therefore, when a persistent mood of dejection began to haunt him. Although without any apparent source, this deepened slowly and he found himself reluctant to leave his house in the evening. He resigned from the committees and no longer visited the club. At the stock exchange, he felt permanently distracted and would stand for hours by the window, staring down at the traffic. Finally, when his grasp of the business began to slip, Mr. Montefiore suggested that he go on an indefinite leave. For a week, Falkman listlessly paced around the huge empty house. Sam Banbury frequently called to see him, but Falkman's sense of grief was beyond any help. He drew the blinds of the windows and changed into a black tie and suit, sat blankly in the darkened library. At last, when his depression had reached its lowest ebb, he went to the cemetery to collect his wife. After the congregation had dispersed, Falkman paused outside the vestry to tip the grave digger, Biddle, and compliment him on his young son, a cherubic three-year-old who was playing among the headstones. Then he rode back to Montmere Park in the car following the hearse, the remainder of the cordage behind him. A grand turnout, James, his sister told him approvingly. Twenty cars altogether, not including the private ones. Falkman thanked her, his eyes examining his sister with critical detachment. In the fifteen years he had known her, she had coarsened perceptibly her voice roughening and her gestures becoming broader. A distinct social gap had always separated them, a division which Falkman had accepted charitably, but it was now widening markedly. Her husband's business had recently begun to fail, and her thoughts had turned almost exclusively to the subjects of money and social prestige. As Falkman congratulated himself on his good sense and success, a curious premonition, indistinct but nonetheless disturbing, stirred through his mind. Like Falkman himself 15 years earlier, his, his wife first lay in her coffin in the hall. The heavy wreaths transforming it into a dark olive green bower. Behind the lowered blinds, the air was dim and stifled. And with her rich red hair flaring off her forehead and her broad cheeks and full lips, his wife seemed to Falkman like some sleeping enchantress in a magical arbor. He gripped the silver foot rail of the coffin and stared at her mindlessly, aware of his sister shepherding the guests to the port and whiskey. He traced with his eyes the exquisite dips and hollows around his wife's neck and chin, the white skin sweeping smoothly to her strong shoulders. Next day, when she was carried upstairs, her presence filled the bedroom. All afternoon, he sat beside her, waiting patiently for her to wake. Shortly after five o'clock, in the few minutes of light left before the dusk descended, when the air hung motionlessly under the trees in the garden, a faint echo of life moved across her face. Her eyes cleared and then focused on the ceiling. Breathlessly, Falkman leaned forward and took one of her cold hands. Far within it, the pulse sounded faintly. Marion, he whispered. Her head inclined slightly, lips parting in a weak smile. 
For several moments, she gazed, gazed serenely at her husband. Hello, Jamie. His wife's arrival completely rejuvenated Falkman. A devoted husband, he was soon completely immersed in their life together. As she recovered from the long illness after her arrival, Falkman entered the prime of his life. His gray hair became sleek and black. His face grew thicker, his chin firmer and stronger. He returned to the stock exchange, taking up his job with renewed interest. He and Marion made a handsome couple. At intervals, they would visit the cemetery and join in the service celebrating the arrival of another one of their friends, but these became less frequent. Other parties continually visited the cemetery, thinning the ranks of the graves, and large areas had reverted to open lawn as the coffins were withdrawn and the tombstones removed. The firm of undertakers near the cemetery, which was responsible for notifying mourning relatives, closed down and was sold. Finally, after the gravedigger Biddle recovered his own wife from the last of the graves, the cemetery was converted into a children's playground. The years of their marriage were Falkman's happiest. With each successive summer, Marion became slimmer and more youthful. Her red hair, a brilliant diadem that stood out among the crowds in the street when she came to see him. They would walk home arm in arm in the summer evenings, pause along the willows by the river to embrace each other like lovers. Indeed, their happiness became such a byword among their friends that over 200 guests attended the church ceremony celebrating the long years of their marriage. As they knelt together at the altar before the priest, Marion seemed to Falkman like a demure rose. This was the last night they were to spend together. Over the years, Falkman had become less interested in his work with the stock exchange, and the arrival of older and more serious men had resulted in a series of demotions for him. Many of his friends were facing similar problems. Harold Caldwell had been forced to resign his professorship and was now a junior lecturer taking postgraduate courses to familiarize himself with the great body of new work that had been done in the previous 30 years. Sam Banbury was a waiter at the Swan Hotel. Marion went to live with her parents in the Falkman's apartment to which they had moved some years earlier after the house was closed and sold was let to new tenants. Falkman, whose tastes had become simpler as the years passed, took a room in a hostel for young men, but he and Marion saw each other every evening. He felt increasingly restless, half conscious that his life was moving toward an inescapable focus, and often thought of giving up his job. Marion remonstrated with him, but you'll lose everything you've worked for, Jamie, all those years. Falkman shrugged, chewing on a stem of grass as they lay in the park during one of their lunch hours. Marion was now a sales girl in, the, in a department store. Perhaps, but I resent being demoted. Even Montefiore is leaving. His grandfather has just been appointed chairman. He rolled over and put his head in her lap. It's so dull in that stuffy office with all those pious old men. I'm not satisfied longer. Marion smiled affectionately at his naivete and enthusiasm. Falkman was now more handsome than she had ever remembered him, his suntanned face almost unlined. It's been wonderful together, Marion, he told her on the eve of their 30th anniversary. How lucky we've been to never have had a child. Do you realize that some people even have three or four? It's absolutely tragic. It comes to us all, though, Jamie, she reminded him. Some people say it's very beautiful and noble experience having a child. All evening, he and Marion wandered around the town together. Falkman's desire for her quickened by her increasing demureness. Since she had gone to live with her parents, Marion had become almost too shy to take his hand. Then he lost her. Walking through the market in the town center, they were joined by two of Marion's friends, Elizabeth and Evelyn German. There's Sam Banbury, Evelyn pointed out as a firework crackled from a stall on the other side of the market, playing the fool as usual. 
She and her sister clucked disapprovingly. Tight-mouthed and stern, they wore dark serge coat buttoned to their necks. Distracted by Sam, Falkman wandered off a few steps. Suddenly, he found that the three girls had walked away. Darting through the crowd, he tried to catch up with them, briefly glimpsed Marion's red hair. He fought his way through the stalls, almost knocking over a barrel of vegetables, and shouted at Sam Banbury, Sam, have you seen Marion? Banbury pocketed his crackers and helped him to scan the crowd. For an hour they searched. Finally, Sam gave up and went home, leaving Falkman to hang about the cobbled square under the dim lights when the market closed, wandering around the tinsel and litter as the stall holders packed up for home. Excuse me, have you seen a girl here? A girl with red hair? Hi, Frankie. Hi, Ari Velton. Please, she was here this afternoon. A girl called. Stunned, he realized that he had forgotten her name. Shortly afterward, Falkman gave up his job and went to live with his parents. Their small red brick house was on the opposite side of town. Between the crowded chimney pots, he could sometimes see the distant slopes of Montmere Park. His life now began a less carefree phase, as most of his energy went into helping his mother and looking after his sister Betty. By comparison with his own house, his parents' home was bleak and uncomfortable, altogether alien to everything Falkman had previously known. Although kind and respectable people, his parents' lives were circumscribed by their lack of success or education. They had no interest in music or the theater, and Falkman found his mind beginning to dull and coarsen. His father was openly critical of him for leaving his job, but the hostility between them gradually subsided as he more and more began to dominate Falkman, restricting his freedom and reducing his pocket money, even warning him not to play with certain of his friends. In fact, going to live with his parents had taken Falkman into an entirely new world. By the time he began to go to school, Falkman had completely forgotten his past life. His memories of Marion and the great house where they had lived surrounded by servants together obliterated. During his first term at school, he was in a class with the older boys, whom the teachers treated as equals. But like his parents, they began to extend their, extend their influence over him as the years passed. At times, Falkman rebelled against this attempt to suppress him and his own personality. But at last, they entirely dominated him, controlling his activities and molding his thoughts and speech. The whole process of education, he dimly realized, was designed to prepare him for the strange twilight world of his earliest childhood. It deliberately eliminated every trace of sophistication breaking down with its constant repetitions and brain-splitting exercises all his knowledge of language and mathematics, substituting them uh, for a collection of meaningless rhymes and chants, and out of this constructing an artificial world of total infant infantilism. Infantilism? At last, with the process of education, at last, when the process of education had reduced him almost to the stage of an inarticulate infant, his parents intervened by removing him from the school, and the final years of his life were spent at home. Mama, can I sleep with you? Mrs. Falkman looked down at the serious-faced little boy who leaned his head on her pillow. Affectionately, she pinched his square jaw and then touched her husband's shoulder as he stirred. Despite the years between father and son, their two bodies were almost identical, with the same broad shoulders and broad heads, and the same thick hair. Not today, Jamie, but soon, perhaps, one day. The child watched his mother with wide eyes, wondering why she should be crying to herself, guessing that perhaps she, he had touched upon one of the taboos that had exercised such a potent fascination for all the boys at school the mystery of their ultimate destination that remained carefully shrouded by their parents, which they themselves were no longer able to grasp. By now, he was beginning to experience the first difficulties in both walking and feeding himself. 
He tottered about clumsily, his small piping voice tripping over his tongue. Steadily, his vocabulary diminished until he knew only his mother's name. When he could no longer stand upright, she would carry him in her arms, feeding him like an elderly invalid. His mind clouded, a few constants of warmth and hunger drifting through it hazily. As long as he could, he clung to his mother. Shortly afterward, Falkman and his mother visited the lying-in hospital for several weeks. On her return, Mrs. Falkman remained in bed for a few days, but gradually she began to move about more freely, slowly shedding the additional weight accumulated during her confinement. Some nine months after she returned from the hospital, a period during which she and her husband thought continually of their son, the shared tragedy of his approaching death, a symbol of their own imminent separation, bringing them closer together, they went away on their honeymoon. How creepy it would be to live your life backwards. It would be just as heartbreaking as it is forwards. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Thank you for the likes. How are you doing this evening? Oh, the next one is called Of Space Time in the River. Gregory Benford is the author. Gregory Benford has two faces, a respected professor, a respected professional physicist specializing in extragalactic plasma jets and a fiction writer with remarkable literary skill. <laughs> of space, time, and the river. Ooh. This is still the future, but this was, was a lot further off when I first read it. It definitely seemed more in the future now. 2048, that's only 24 years from now. Monday, December 5th, 2048. We took a limo to Los Angeles for the 9 a.m. flight LAX to Cairo. On the boost up, we went over 1.4G Contrareg. And a lot of passengers complained, especially the poor thins in their clank shank rigs. The ones that keep you walking even after the hip replacements fail. Joanna, seasoned traveler that she is, slept through it all. And I occupied myself with musing about finally seeing the ancient Egypt I had dreamed about as a kid back at the turn of the century. If thou beest born to strange sights, Things invisible to see, ride ten thousand days and nights till age snow white hairs on thee. I've got the snow powdering at the temples and steadily expanding waistline, so I guess John Don applies. Good to see I can still summon up lines I first read as a teenager. There are some rewards to being a professor of computer literature at UC Irving, even if you do have to scrimp to afford a trip like this. The tour agency said the cortex didn't, hadn't interfered with tourism at all. In fact, you hardly noticed them. They deliberately blended in so well. How a seven foot insectoid thing with gleaming russet skin can look like an Egyptian, I don't know. But what the hell, Joanna said, let's go anyway. I hope she's right. I mean, it's been 14 years since the cortex landed. Open the first diplomatic interstellar relations and then chose Egypt as the only place on earth where they cared to carry out what they called their cultural studies. I guess we'll get a look at that too. The cortex keep to themselves, veiling their multi-layered deals behind diplomatic dodges. As if six hours of travel weren't numbing enough, including the orbital delay because of an unannounced Chinese launch, we both watched 
a hollow D about one of those new biotech guys called Straight from the Hearts, an unending string of single entendre jokes. In our stupefied state, it was just about right. As we descended over Cairo, is clear and about 15 degrees Celsius. We stumbled off the plain, sandy-eyed from riding 10,000 days and nights in a wh whistling aluminum box. The airport was scruffy, instant, third-world hubbub, confusion and filth. One departure lounge was filled exclusively with turbaned men, heavy security everywhere, no cortex around. Maybe they do blend in. Our bus across Cairo passed a decayed aqueduct about which milled men in caftans, women in black, animals eating garbage. People packed into the most unlikely living spots, carrying out peddlers' business in dusty spots between buildings, traffic alternately frenetic or frozen. We crawled across Cairo to Giza, the pyramids abruptly looming out of the twilight. The hotel, Mena House, was the hunting lodge cum palace of 19th century kings. Elegant. Welcome. Hi. I was, I was late today. Thanks for joining me. How are you, Travis? Hi, Bruno. Buffet, supper was good. Sleep came like weight. December 6, 2048. Joanna says this journal is good therapy for me. Might even get me back into the habit of writing again. She says every comp lit type is frustrated as an author and I should just spew my bile into this diary. So be it. Thou, when thou returnest, wilt tell me all strange wonders that befell thee. World, you have been warned. Set off south today to Memphis, the ancient capital lost when its walls were breached in a war and subsequent floods claimed it. The famous fallen Ramses statue looked powerful still, even lying down. Makes you feel like a pygmy me tiptoeing around a giant, a la Gulliver. Saqqara, principal necropolis of Memphis, survives three kilometers away in the desert. First dynasty tombs, including the first pyramid made of steps five levels high. New kingdom graffiti inside are now history themselves from our perspective. Hi, D, welcome. On to the Great Pyramid by Camel. The drivers proved even more harassing than legend warned. We entered the Pyramid of Kefren, slightly shorter than that of his father, Cheops. Even all the 80 known pyramids were found stripped. These passages have a constricted vacancy to them, empty now for longer than they were filled. Their silent mass is unnerving. Professor Alvarez from UC Berkeley tried to find hidden rooms here by placing cosmic ray detectors in the lower known rooms and looking for slight increases in flux at certain angles, but there seemed to be none. There are seismic and even radio measurements of the dry sands in the Giza region looking for echoes of buried tombs, but no big finds so far. Plenty of echoes from ruins of ordinary houses, etc. though. No serious jet lag today, but we nod off when we can. Handy having the hotel a few hundred yards from the pyramids. I tried to get Joanna to leave her wrist calm at home. Since her breakdown, she can't take the news of daily disasters very well. Who can, really? She's pretty steady now, but this trip should be as calm as possible, her doctor told me. So, of course, she turns on the calm and it's full of hysterical stuff about another border clash between the Empire of Israel and the Arab Mohammed Soviet. Smart rockets versus smart defenses. A draw. Some things never change. I turned it off immediately. Joanna's hands shook for hours afterwards. I brushed it off. Still, it's different when you're a few hundred miles from the lines. Hope we're safe here. December 7th, 2048. 
into Cairo itself, the Egyptian Museum, the Tut Ankh Amen exhibit, huge treasuries, opulent jewels, a sheer wondrous plenitude. There are endless cases of beautiful alabaster bowls, gold, lemon, gold laminate boxes, testifying to thousands of years of productivity. I wandered down a musty marble corridor and then coming out of a gloomy side passage, there was the first cortex I'd ever seen, big clacking and clicking as it thrust forward in that six-legged gait. It ignored me, of course. They nearly always lurch by humans as though they can't see us. Or else that distant, distracted gaze means we're, they're ruminating over strange alien ideas. Who knows why they're intensely studying ancient Egyptian ways and ignoring the rest of us. This one was cradling a stone urn a meter high at least. It carried the black granite in three akimbo arms, hardly seeming to notice the weight. I caught a whiff of acrid pungency, the fluid that lubricates their joints. Then it was gone. This is this is a story set in the future. Um, written probably in the 80s. Just be aware of that. Some things never change. <laughs> He's predicting what's gonna what it's gonna be like in 24 years. Who knows? Did you did you catch that he referred to it as the Empire of Israel there? Like that's what this uh, that's what this physicist is predicting for 2048. That it's going to be constant battling still there in 24 years. With aliens, of course. With the aliens landing. We left and visited the oldest Coptic church in Egypt, supposedly where Moses hid out when he was on the lamb. Looks it. The old section of Cairo is crowded, decayed, people laboring in every nook with minimal tools, much standing around watching as others work. The only sign of really efficient labor was a gang of men and women hauling long, cigar-shaped yellow things on wagons, something the cortex wanted placed outside the city, our guard said. In the evening, we went to the sound and light show at the Sphinx. Excellent. There is even a version in the cortex language, those funny sputtering barking sounds. Arabs say, men, man fears time. Time fears the pyramids. You get that feeling here. Afterwards, we ate at, at, <laughs> in the hotel's Indian restaurant quite fine. December 8th. Cairo is a city being trampled to death. It's grown by a factor of 14 in population since the revolution in 1952, and it shows. The old Victorian homes that once lined stately streets of willowy trees are now crowded by modern slab concrete apartment houses. The aged buildings are kept going, not from a sense of history, but because no matter how run down they get, somebody needs them. The desert's grit invades everywhere. Plants in the courtyards have a weary, resigned look. Civilization hasn't been very good for the old ways. Maybe that's why the cortex seemed to dislike anything built since the time of the Romans. I saw one running some kind of machine, a, a black contraption that floated two meters off the ground. It was laying some kind of cable in the ground right along the bank of the Nile. Every time it met a building, it just slammed through, smashing everything to frags. Guess the Cortex have squared all this with the Egyptian government because there were police all around, making sure nobody got in the way. Odd. But not unpredictable. When you think about it, the Cortex have those levitation devices, which everybody would love to get the secret of. Ending sentence with preposition, horrors, but this is vacation, damn it. They've been playing coy for years, letting out only a trickle of technology with the Egyptians holding the patents. That must be what's holding the Egyptian economy together in the face of their unrelenting population crunch. The cortex started out as guests here, studying the ruins and so on, but now it's obvious that they have 
free run of the place. They own it. Still, the cortex haven't given away the crucial devices which would enable us to find out how they do it. Or so my colleagues in the physics department tell me. It vexes them that this alien race can master space-time so completely, manipulating gravity itself, and we can't get the knack of it. We visited the famous alabaster moss. It perches on a hill called the Citadel. Elegant, cool, aloofly dominated in the city. The old bazaar nearby is a warren, so much like the movie sets once seen that it has an unreal Arabian Nights quality. We bought spices. The calls to worship from the mosques reach you everywhere, even in the most secluded back rooms where Joanna was haggling over jewelry. It's impossible to get anything really ancient, the swarthy little merchant said. The cortex have bought them up, trading gold for anything that might be from the time of the pharaohs. There have been a lot of fakes over the last few centuries, some really good ones, so the cortex have just bought anything that might be real. No wonder the Egyptians like them, let them chew up their houses if they want. Gold speaks louder than the past. That's a good line right there. Gold speaks louder than the past. We boarded our cruise ship, the venerable Nile Concord. Lunch was excellent, Italian. We explored Cairo in mid-afternoon through markets of incredible dirt and disarray. Calf brains displayed without a hint of refrigeration or protection. Flies swarming, etc. Fun, especially if you can keep from breathing for five minutes or more. We stopped in the Shepherd's Hotel, the site of many Brit spy novels, Magam especially. It has an excellent bar, Nubians and Saudis, etc. Putting away decidedly non-Islamic gins and beers. A cortex was sitting in a special chair at the back, talking through a voice box to a Saudi. I couldn't tell what they were saying, but the Saudi had a gleam in his eyes. Driving a bargain, I'd say. Great atmosphere in the bar, though. A cloth banner over the bar proclaims, Unborn tomorrow and dead yesterday, why fret about them if today be sweet? Indeed, yes. Um, bartender. Friday, December 9th, Muslim Holy Day. We left Cairo at 11 p.m. last night, the city gliding past our stateroom windows, lovelier in misty radiance than in dusty day. We cruised all day. Buffet, breakfast, and lunch, solid Eastern and Mediterranean stuff, passable red wine. A hundred meters away, the past presses at us, going about its business, as if the pharaohs were still calling the tune. Primitive pumping irrigation, donkeys doing work, women cleaning gray clothes in the Nile. Desert ramparts to the east. At spots sending sand fingers, no longer swept away by the annual flood, across the fields to the shore itself. Muslim tombs of stone and mud brick coast by as we lounge on the top deck, peering at the madly waving children through our binoculars across a chasm of time. There are about 50 aboard a ship with a capacity of 100, so there's plenty of room and service as we sweep serenely on, music flooding the deck, cutting between slabs of antiquity, not quite decadent, just intelligently sybaritic. Why so few tourists? Guide guesses people are afraid of the cortex. Joanna gets jittery around them, but I don't know if it's only her old fears surfacing again. The spindly ethereal minarets are often the only grace notes in the br mud brick villages, like a lovely idea trying to rise out of a brown mottled chaos. Animal power is used wherever possible. Still, the villagers are quiet at night. The flip side of this peacefulness must be boredom. That explains a lot of history and its rabid faiths, unfortunately. December 10th, 2024. 
up 2048. <laughs> December 10th, 2048. Civilization thins steadily as we stream upriver. The mud brick villages typically have no electricity. There is ample power from Aswan, but the power lines and stations are too expensive. One would think that with the Cortex gold, they could do better now. Our gold says... The our guide says the cortex have been very hard nosed, no pun intended, about such improvements. They will not let the earnings from their patents be used to modernize Egypt. Feeding the poor, cleaning the Nile, rebuilding monuments, all fine. In fact, they pay handsomely for re restoring projects. But better electricity? No. A flat no. We landed at a scruffy town and took a bus into the western desert. Only a kilometer from the flat flood plain, the Sahara is utterly barren and forbidding. We visited a Ptolemaic city of the dead. One tomb has a mummy of a girl who drowned trying to cross the Nile to see her lover, the hieroglyphs say. Nearby are catacombs of mummified baboons and ibises, symbols of wisdom. The tunnel begins here, pointing southeast from Akhenaten's capital city. The German discoverers in the last century, the German discoverers in the last century followed it for 40 kilometers, all cutting through limestone, a gigantic task, before turning back because of bad air. What was it for? Nobody knows. Dry, spooky atmosphere, urns of desiccated mummies undisturbed. To duck down a side corridor is to step into a mystery. I left the tour group and ambled over a low hill to take a pee, actually. To the west was sand, sand, sand. I was standing there doing a bit to hold off the dryness when I saw one of those big black contraptions come slipping over the far horizon. Chuffing, chugging, and laying what looks like pipe. A funny kind of pipe, all silver, with blue facets running through it. The glittering shifted, changed to yellows and reds while I watched. A cortex riding atop it, of course. It ran due south, roughly parallel to the Nile. When I got back and told Joanna about it, she looked at the map, and we couldn't figure out what would be out there of interest to anybody, even a cortex. No ruins around. Nothing. Funny. Hi, welcome. December 11th, 2048. Beni Hassan, a nearly deserted site near the Nile. A steep walk up the escarpment of the eastern desert after crossing the rich floodplain by donkey. The rock tombs have fine drawings and some statues. Still left because they were cut directly from the mountain and have thick wedges securing them to it. Guess the ancients would steal anything not nailed down. One thing about the cortex, the guide says, they take nothing. They seem genuinely interested in restoring, not in carting artifacts back home to their neck of the galactic spiral arm. Upriver, we landfall beside a vast dust plain, which we cross in a cart pulled by a tractor. The mud brick palaces of Akhenaten have vanished, except for a bit of Nefertiti's palace, where the famous bust of her was found. The royal tombs in the mountains above are defaced. Big chunks pulled out of the walls by priests who undercut up Akhenaten's monotheist revolution after his death. The wall carvings are very realistic and warm. The women even have nipples. The tunnel from yesterday probably runs under here perhaps connecting with the passageways we see deep in the king's grave shafts. Again, nobody's explored them thoroughly. There are narrow sections, possibly warrens for snakes or scorpions, maybe even traps. It takes a minute to see that the reddish shell isn't a sarcophagus at all, but the back of a cortex. It's planting sucker-like things to the walls, threading cables through them. I can see more of the stuff further back in the shadows. The cortex looks up into our flashlight beam and scuttles away, exploring the tunnels. But why did it move away so fast? What's to hide? 
December 12th. Cruise all day and watch the shore slide by. Joanna is right. I need this vacation a great deal. I can see that rereading this journal. It gets looser as I go along. As do I. <clears throat> when I consider how my life is spent ere half my days in this dark world and wide, the pell-mell of university life dulls my sense of wonder, of simple pleasure simply taken. The Nile has a flowing, infinite quality, free of time. I can feel what it was like to live here, part of a great celestial clock that brought the perpetually turning sun and moon, the perennial rhythm of the flood. Aswan has interrupted the ebb and flow of the waters, but the steady force of the Nile rolls on. Heaven smiles and faiths and empires gleam like wrecks of a dissolving dream. The peacefulness permeates everything. Last night, making love to Joanna was the best ever. Magnifique! And I know you're reading this, Joanna. I saw you sneak it out of the suitcase yesterday. Well, it was the best. Quite a tribute after all these years. And there's tomorrow and tomorrow. Hi, welcome. This is live, yes. I would rather block your ass. <clears throat> that was a good one, though. That was a good one, though. He who bends himself to a joy does this winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. Perhaps, perhaps next term I shall request the Romantic Poets course, or even write a few stanzas myself. Three cortex flew overhead today carrying what looked like ancient ram's head statues. The guide says statues were moved around a lot by the Arabs and, of course, the archaeologists. The Cortex have negotiated permission to take many of them back to their rightful places, if known. December 13th. Landfall at Abydos, a limestone temple miraculously preserved, its thick roof intact. Clusters of scruffy mud huts surround it, but do not diminish its obdurate rectangular severity. <clears throat> The famous list of pharaohs chiseled in a side corridor is impressive in its sweep of time. Each little entry was a lordly pharaoh, and there's a whole wall jammed full of them. Egypt lasted longer than any comparable society, and the mass of names on that wall is even more impressive, since the temple builders did not even give it the importance of a central location. The list omits Hatshepsut, a mere woman, and Akhenaten, the scandalous monotheist. Ramses II had all carvings here cut deeply, particularly on the immense columns, to forestall defacement. A possibility he was much aware of since he was busily doing it to his ancestors' temples. He chiseled away earlier work, adding his own cartouches, apparently thinking he could fool the gods themselves into believing he had built them all himself. Ah, immortality. Had an earthquake today. We were on the ship, Joanna dutifully padding back and forth along the main deck to work off the opulent lunch. We saw the palms waving ashore, and damned if there wasn't a small shockwave in the water going east to west, and then a kind of low grumbling from the east. Guide says he's never seen anything like it. And tonight, sheets of ruby light rising up from both east and west. Looked like an aurora, only the wrong directions. The rippling aura changed colors as it rose, then met overhead, burst into gold, and died. I swear I heard a high keening note sound as the burnt gold line flared and faded, flared and faded, spanning the sky. Not many on, people on deck, though, so it didn't cause much comment. Joanna's theory is it was the rocket exhaust. An engineer says it looks like something to do with magnetic fields. 
I'm no scientist, but it seems to me whatever the Cortex want to do, they can. Lords of space-time, they call themselves in the diplomatic ceremonies. The United Nations representatives wrote that office hyperbole, but the Cortex may mean it. December 14th, 2048. Dendera. A vast temple, much less well-known than Karnak, but quite as impressive. Cortex there, digging at the foundations. Guide says they're looking for some secret passageways, maybe. The Egyptian government is letting them do what they damn well please. On the way back to the ship, we passed a whole mass of people, hundreds, all dressed in costumes. I thought it was some sort of pageant or tourist tomfoolery, but the guide frowned, saying he didn't know what to make of it. The mob was chanting something even the guide couldn't make out. He said the rough cut cloth was typical of the old ways, made on the crude spinning wheels. The procession was ragged, but seemed headed for the temple. They looked drunk to me. The guide tells me that the ancients had a theology based on the Nile. This country is essentially 10 kilometers wide and 700 kilometers long, a narrow band of livable earth pressed between two deadly deserts. So they believed the gods must have intended it and that the Nile was the center of the whole damn world. The sun came from the east, meaning that's where things began. Ending, dying, happened in the west, where the sun went. Thus they buried their dead on the west side of the Nile, even 7,000 years ago. At night, the sun swung below and lit the underworld where everybody went finally. Kind of comforting, thinking of the sun doing duty like that for all the dead. Only the virtuous dead, though, if you didn't follow the rules. Some are born to sweet delight, some are born to endless night. The world was neatly bisected by the great river, and they loved to clean divisions. They invented the 24-hour day, but loving symmetry, split it in half. Each of the 12 daylight hours was longer in the summer than in the winter, and for night, vice versa. They built an entire nation-state, an immortal hand or eye, framing such fearful symmetry. On to Karnak itself, mooring at Luxor. The middle and late pharaohs couldn't afford the labor investment for pyramids, so they contented themselves with additions to the huge sprawl at Karnak. I wondered how long it would be before someone rich notices that for a few million or so, he could build a tomb bigger than the Great Pyramid. It would only take a million or so limestone blocks, or much better granite, and could be better isolated and protected. If you can't conquer a continent or scribble a symphony, Pile up a great stack of stones. L'Eternité ne fut jamais perdue. The light show tonight at Karnak was spooky at times and beautiful, with booming voices coming right out of the stones. Saw a cortex in the crowd. It stared straight ahead, not noticing anybody, but not bumping into any humans either. It looked enthralled. The beady eyes, all four, scanned the shifting blues and burnt oranges that played along the rising columns, the tumbled great statues. Its lubricating fluids made shiny reflections as it articulated forward, clacking in the dry night air. Somehow it was almost reverential. Rearing above the crowd, unmoving for long moments, it seemed more like the giant frozen figures in stone than like mere mortals who swarmed around it, keeping a respectful distance, muttering to themselves. Unnerving somehow to see. A subtler sphinx renew, riddles of death Thebes never knew. December 15th. A big day, the valley of the queens, the nobles, and finally of the king. Woo! All are dry washes, wadis, obviously easy to guard and isolate. Nonetheless, all of the 62 known tombs except Tut's were rifled, probably within a few centuries of burial. It must have been an inside job. There is speculation that the robbing became a needed part of the economy, recycling the wealth and providing gaudy displays for the next pharaoh to show off at his funeral, all the better to keep impressing the peasants. Just another part of the socioeconomic machine, folks. Later, priests collected the pharaoh's mummies and hid them in a cave nearby, realizing they couldn't protect the tombs. 
Preservation of Tutmosis III is excellent. His hook-nosed mummy has been returned to its tomb. A big, deep thing, larger than our own apartment, several floors in all, connected by ramps with side treasuries, galleries, etc. The inscription above reads, You shall live again forever. Hi, welcome. You're reading Gregory Benford of Space, Time, and the River. All picked clean, of course, except for the sarcophagus, too heavy to carry away. The pyramids had porticulluses, deadfalls, pitfalls, and rolling stones to crush the unwary robber, but there are few here. Still, it's a little creepy to think about all those ancient engineers planning to commit murder in the future long after they themselves are gone, all to protect the past. Death be not proud. An afternoon of shopping at the bazaar, the old Victorian hotel on the river is atmospheric but has few guests. Food continues good. No dysentery either. We both took the easy D bacteria before we left, so it's living down in our tracks, festering away, lying in wait for any ugly foreign bug. Comforting. December 16th, 2048. Cruise on. We stop at Kom Ombo, a temple at, uh, to the crocodile god Sebek, built to placate the crocs who swarmed in the river nearby. The Nile is cleared of them now, unfortunately. They would have added some zest to the cruise. A small room contains 98 mummified crocs, stacked like cordwood. Cruised some more. A few kilometers south, there were gangs of Egyptians working beside the river, hauling blocks of granite down to the water, rolling them on logs. I stood on the deck, trying to figure out why they were using ropes and simple pulleys and no powered machinery. Then I saw a cortex near the top of the rise where the blocks were being sawed out of the rock face. It reared up again over the men, gesturing with those jerky arms, eyes glittering. It called out something in a halfway human voice, only in a language I didn't know. The guide came over frowning, but he couldn't understand it either. The laborers were pulling ropes across ruts in the stone feeding sand and water into the gap, cutting out blocks by sheer brute abrasion. It must take weeks to extract one at that rate. Further along, others drove wooden planks down into the deep grooves, hammering them with crude woolen mallets, wooden mallets. When they poured water over the planks, and we could hear the stone pop open as the wood expanded far down in the cup. That's the way the ancients did it, the guide said kind of quietly. The cortex towered above the human teams, that jangling, harsh voice booming out over the water, each syllable lingering until the next joined it, blending in the dry air, hollow and ringing and remorseless. Note added later. Stopped at Edfu, a, a well-preserved temple buried 100 feet deep by Muslim garbage until the late 19th century. The best aspect of river cruising is pulling along a site, viewing it from the angles the river affords, then stepping from your stateroom directly into antiquity with nothing to intervene and break the mood. Trouble is, this time a man in front of us goes off away to photograph the ship, and suddenly something is rushing at him out of the weeds, and the crew is yelling, It's a crocodile! The guy drops his camera and bolts. The croc looks at all of us, snorts, and waddles back into the Nile. The guide is upset, maybe even more than the fellow who almost got turned into a free lunch. Who would introduce Crocs back into the Nile? <clears throat> December 17th. Aswan, a clean, delightful town. The big dam just south of town is impressive with its monument to Soviet excellence, etc. A hollow joke considering how poor the USSR is today. Oh my God, was this written before the fall of the USSR? That's funny. 80s. It, I don't know when this short story was written. <clears throat> but he wrote a novel. His award-winning novel was 1980. That's funny. That's funny. Anyway, where was I?
they could use a loan from Egypt. The unforeseen side effects, though, rising water table bringing more insects, rotting away the carvings in the temples, rapid silting up inside the dam itself, etc., are getting important. They plan to dig a canal and drain a lot of the incoming new silt into the de desert, making a huge farming valley with it, but I don't see how they can drain enough water to carry the dirt and still leave much behind in the original dam. The guide says they're having trouble with it. We then fly south to Abo Simbel, like Lake Nasser, which claimed the original site of the huge monuments is hundreds of miles long. They enlarged it again in 2008. God, this is funny. That's fine. In the times of the pharaohs, the land below these waters held villages, great couriers for the construction of monuments, trade routes south to the Nubian kingdoms. Now it's all underwater. They did save the enormous temples to Ramses II, built to impress aggressive Nubians with his might and majesty, and to his queen, Nefertiti, Nefertari. The colossal statues of Ramses II seem personifications of his egomania. Inside, carvings show him performing all the valiant tasks in the great battle with the Hittites, slaying, taking prisoners, then presenting them to himself, who is in turn advised by the gods, which include himself. All this for a battle which was, in fact, an iffy draw. <coughs> true. That is true. Both temples have been... <laughs> lifted about a hundred feet and set back inside a holy artificial hill supported inside by the largest concrete dome in the world amazing look upon my works ye mighty and despair except that when Shelley wrote Ozymandias he'd never seen Ramses the second image so well preserved Leaving the site, eating the sand blown into our faces by a sudden gust of wind, I caught sight of a cortex. It was burrowing into the sand using a silvery tool that spat ruby-colored light. Beside it, floating on a platform, were some of those funny pipe-like things I'd seen days before. Only this time, men and women were helping it, lugging stuff around to put into the holes the cortex dug. The people looked dazed like they were sleepwalking. I waved a greeting, but nobody even looked up, except the cortex. They're expressionless, of course. Still, those glittering pop eyes peered at me for a long moment, with the little feelers near its mouth twitching with a kind of anxious energy. I looked away. I couldn't help but feel a little spooked by it. It wasn't looking at us in a friendly way. Maybe it didn't want me yelling at its work gang. Then we flew back to Aswan above the impossibly narrow ribbon of green that snakes through the absolute bitter desolation. December 18th. I'm writing this at twilight before the light gives out. We've got up this morning and we're walking into town when the whole damn ground started to rock. Mud huts slamming down, waves on the Nile, everything. Got back to the ship, but nobody knew what was going on. Not much on the radio. Cairo came in clear, saying there'd been a quake all night, all along the Nile. Funny thing was, the captain couldn't raise any other radio station. Just Cairo. Nothing else in the whole Middle East. Some other passengers think there's a war on. Maybe so, but the Egyptian army doesn't know about it. They're standing around all along the quay, fondling their AK-47s, looking just as puzzled as we are. More rumblings and shakings in the afternoon, and now the sun's about gone. I can see big sheets of light in the sky. Only it seems to me the constellations aren't right. Joanna took some of her pills. She's trying to fend off the jitters, and I do what I can. I hate the hollow look that comes into her eyes. We've got to get the hell out of here. December 19th, 2048. I might as well write this down. There's nothing else to do. When we got up this morning, the sun was there, all right, but the moon hadn't gone down. And it didn't all day. Surely, they can both be in the sky at the same time, but all day? Joanna is worried, not because of the moon, but because all the airline flights have been canceled. We were supposed to go back to Cairo today. 
More earthquakes, really bad this time. At noon, all of a sudden, there were cortex everywhere. In the air, swarming in from the east and west, some splashed down in the Nile and didn't come up. Others zoomed overhead, heading south toward the dam. Nobody's been brave enough to leave the ship, including me. Hell, I just want to go home. Joanna's staying in the cabin. About an hour later, a swarthy man in raggedy gray suit comes running along the quay and says, The dam's gone. Just gone. <laughs> the cortex formed little knots above it, and there were a lot of purple flashing lights and big crackling noises, and the, then the dam just disappeared. But the water hasn't come pouring down on us here. The man says it ran back the other way. South. I looked over the rail. The Nile was flowing north. Late this afternoon, five of the crew went into town. By the time there were fingers of orange and gold zapping across the sky all the time, making weird designs. The clouds would come rolling in from the north, and these radiant beams would hit them, and they'd split the clouds just like that, with a spray of ivory light, and cortex buzzing everywhere. There's a kind of high sheen up above the clouds, like a metal boundary or something, but you can see through it. Hey, welcome, Batman. Cortex keeps zipping up to it, sometimes coming right up and out of the Nile itself, just splashing out, then zooming up until they're little dwindling dots. They spin around up there as if inspecting it, and then they drop like bricks and splash down in the Nile again. Like frantic bees, Joanna said, and her voice trembled. A technical type on board, an engineer from Rockwell, says he thinks the Cortex are putting on one hell of a light show. Just a weird alien stunt, he thinks. While I was writing this, the five crewmen returned from Aswan. They'd gone to the big hotels there and then to the police headquarters. They heard that TV from Cairo went out two days ago, and all air flights have been grounded because of the cortex buzzing around and the odd lights and so on. At least that's the official line. The captain says his cousin told him that several flights did take off two days back, and they hit something up there. Maybe that blue metallic sheen? One crashed. The others landed, although damaged. The authorities are keeping it quiet. They're not just keeping us tourists in the dark. They're playing mum with everybody. I hope the engineer is right. Joanna is fretting and we hardly ate anything for dinner and just picked at the cold lamb. Maybe tomorrow we'll settle things. December 20th, 2048. It did. When we woke, the earth was rising. It was coming up from the western mountains, blue-white clouds and patches of green and brown, but mostly tawny desert. We're looking west across the Sahara. I'm riding this while everybody else is running around like a chicken with his head chopped off. I'm sitting on deck listening to shouts and wild traffic and even some gunshots coming from ashore. I can see further east now. Either we're turning or we're rising fast and can see with a better perspective. Where central Egypt was, there's a big, raw, dark hole. The black must be the limestone underlying the desert. They've scraped off a rim of sandy margin enclosing the Nile Valley, including us, and left the rest. And somehow they're lifting it free of earth. No cortex flying around now, nothing visible except that metallic blue smear of light high up in the air, and beyond it, earth rising. December 22nd. I skipped a day. There was no time to even think yesterday. After I wrote, wrote the last entry, a crowd of Egyptians came down the quay, shuffling silently along like the ones we saw back at Abu Simbel. Only there were thousands. And leading them was a cortex. It carried a big disc-like thing that made a humming sound. When the cortex lifted it, the pitch changed. It made my eyes water, my skull ache, like a hand squeezing my head, blurring the air. Around me, everybody was writhing on the deck, moaning. Joanna, too. By the time the cortex reached our ship, 
I was the only one standing. Those yellow shot jittery eyes peered at me, giving nothing away. Then the angular head turned and went on. Pied Piper leading long trains of Egyptians. Some of our friends from the ship joined at the end of the lines. Rigid, glassy-eyed faces. I shouted, but nobody, not a single person in that procession, even looked up. Joanna struggled to go with them. I threw her down and held her until the damned eerie parade was long past. Now the ship's deserted. We've stayed aboard out of pure fear. Whatever the cortex did affect all but a few percent of those within range. A few crew stayed aboard, dazed but okay. Scared, hard to talk to. Fewer at dinner. The next morning, nobody. We had to scavenge for food. The crew must have taken what was left aboard. I ventured into the market street nearby, but everything was closed up, deserted. Only a few days ago, we were buying caftans and alabaster sphinxes and beaten bronze trinkets in the gaudy shops, and now it was stone cold dead. Not a sound, not a stray cat. I went around to the back of what I remembered was a filthy corner cafe. I'd turned up my nose at it while we were shopping, certain there was a sure case of dysentery waiting inside, but now I was glad to find some days old fruit and vegetables in a cabinet. <laughs> Coming back, I nearly ran into a bunch of Egyptian men who were marching through the streets. Spooks. They had the look of police, but were dressed up like Mardi Gras, loincloths, big leather belts, bangles and beads, hair stiffened with wax. They carried sharp spears. Good thing I was jumpy or they'd have run right into me. I heard them coming and ducked into a grubby alley. They were systematically combing the area, searching the miserable apartments above the market. The honcho barked orders in a language I didn't understand. Harsh, guttural, not like Egyptian. I slipped away, barely. We kept out of sight after that, stayed below deck and waited for nightfall. Not that the darkness made us feel any better. There were fires ashore, not in Aswan itself. The town was utterly black. Instead, orange dots sprinkled this distant hillsides. They were all over the scrub desert, just before the ramparts of the real desert that stretches, or did stretch, to east and west. Now I guess there's only a few dozen miles of desert before you reach, what? I can't discuss this with Joanna. She has that haunted expression from the time before her breakdown. She is drawn and silent, stays in the room. We ate our goddamn vegetables. Now we go to bed. December 23rd, 2048. There were more of those Mardi Gras spooks today. They came along the quay, looking at the tour ships moored there, but for some reason they didn't come aboard. We're alone on the ship. All the crew, all the crew, the other tourists, all gone. Around noon, when we were getting really hungry and I was mastering my courage to go back to the market street, I heard a roaring. Understand, I hadn't heard an airplane in days, and those were jets. This buzzing, I suddenly realized, is a rocket or something, and it's in trouble. I go out on the deck, checking first to see if the patrols are lurking around, as the roaring is louder. It's a plane with stubby little wings, coming along low over the water, burping and hacking and finally going dead quiet. It nose over and came in for a big splash. I thought the pilot was a goner, but the thing rode in steady on the water for a while and the cockpit folded back and out jumps a man. I yelled at him and he waved and swam for the ship. The plane sank. He caught a line below it and climbed up. An American, no less. But what he had to say was even more surprising. He wasn't just some sky jockey from Cairo. He was an astronaut. He was part of a rescue mission sent up to try to stop the cortex. The others he'd lost contact with, although it looked like they'd all been drawn down toward the floating island that Egypt had become. 
were suspended about two Earth radii out in a slowly widening orbit. There's a shield over us, keeping the air in and everything. Cosmic rays, communications, spaceships, out. The cortex somehow ripped off a layer of Egypt and are lifting it free of Earth, escaping with it. Nobody had ever guessed they had such power. Nobody Earthside knows what to do about it. Cortex, who were outside Egypt at the time, just lifted off in their ships and rendezvous with the floating platform. Ralph Blanchard is his name, and his mission was to fly under the slab of Egypt in a fast orbital craft. He was supposed to see how they'd ripped the land free. A lot of it had fallen away. There are silvery pods under the soil, he says. Must be enormous anti-grav units. The same kind that make the Cortex ships fly that we've been trying to get the secret of. The pods are about a mile apart, making a grid. But between them, there's a lot of Cortex. They're building stuff, tilling up the soil and so on, upside down. The gravity works opposite on the underside. That must be the way the whole thing is kept together, compressing it with artificial gravity from both sides. God knows what makes the shield above. Thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying. Thank you. But the really strange thing is the Nile. There's one on the underside too. It starts at the underside of Alexandria where our Nile meets or met the Mediterranean. Then it flows back all the way along the underside running through a Nile Valley of its own. Then it turns up and around the edge of the slab and comes over the lip of it a few hundred miles upstream of here. The cortex have drained the region beyond the Aswan Dam. Now the Nile flows in its old course. The big temples of Ramses II are perched on a high hill above the river and Ralph was sure he saw cortex working on the site, taking it apart. He thinks they're going to put it back where it was before the dam was built in the 1960s. Ralph was supposed to return to Orbital City with his data. He came in close for a final pass and hit the shield, the one that keeps the air in. His ship was damaged. He'd been issued a suborbital craft able to do re-entries in case he could penetrate the airspace. That saved him. There were other guys who'd hit the shield and cracked through, guys with conventional deep space shuttle tugs and the like, and they fell like bricks. We've talked all this over, but no one has had a good theory of what's going on. The best we can do is stay away from the patrols. Meanwhile, Joanna scavenged through obscure bins of the ship and turned up an entire case of Skiva, a cheap Egyptian beer. So after I finish this ritual entry, who knows, this might be in a history book someday, and as a good academic, I should keep it up, I'll go share it out in one grand burst with Ralph and Joanna. It'll do her good. It'll do us both good. She's been rocky. As well, Malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. December 24th, 2048. This little diary was all I managed to take with us when the spooks came. I had it in my pocket. I keep going over what ha happened. There was nothing I could do, I'm sure of that, and yet we stayed below decks, getting hungry again, but afraid to go out. There was chanting from the distance, getting louder, then footsteps aboard. We retreated to the small cabins aft, third class. The sounds got nearer. Ralph thought we should stand and fight, but I'd seen those spears, and hell, I'm a middle-aged man, no match for those maniacs. Joanna got scared. It was like her breakdown. No, worse. The jitters built into her whole body, and it seemed to vibrate, fingers digging into her hair like claws, eyes squeezed tight, face compressed as if to shut out the world. 
There was nothing I could do with her. She wouldn't keep quiet. She ran out of the cabin we were hiding and just rushed down the corridor screaming at them. Ralph said we should use her as a diversion to get away, and I said I'd stay, help her, but then I saw them grab her and hold her. Not rough. It didn't seem as if they were going to do anything, just take her away. My fear got the better of me then. It's hard to write this. Part of me says I should have stayed, defended her, but it was hopeless. You can't live up to your ideal self. The world of literature shows people summoning up courage, but there's a thin line between that and stupidity. Or so I tell myself. The spooks hadn't seen us yet, so we slipped overboard, keeping quiet. We went off the loading ramp on the riverside, away from the shore. Ralph paddled around to see the quay and came back, looking worried. There were spooks swarming all over. We had to move. The only way to go was across the river. This shaking handwriting is from sheer flat-out fatigue. I swam what seemed like forever. The water wasn't bad, pretty warm, but the current kept pushing us off course. Lucky thing the Nile is pretty narrow there, and there are rocky little stubs sticking out. I grabbed onto those and rested. Nobody saw us, or at least they didn't do anything about it. We got ashore looking like drowned rats. There's a big hill there covered with ancient rock-cut tombs. I thought of taking shelter in one of them and started up the hill, legs wobbly under me, and then we saw a mob up top. And a cortex, a big one with a shiny shell. It wore something over its head. Supposedly cortex don't wear clothes, but this one had a funny rig on. A big bird head with a long, narrow beak and a flinty, flinty black eyes. There was a madness all around us. Long lines of people carrying burdens, chanting. Cortex riding on those lifter units of theirs, all beneath the piercing, biting sun. We hid for a while. I found this diary in its zippered leather case, made it through the river without a leak. I started writing this entry. Joanna said once that I'd retreated into books as a defense in adolescence. She was full of psychoanalytical explanations. It was a hobby. She kept thinking that if she could figure herself out, things would be all right. Well, maybe I did use words in books and a quiet orderly life as a place to hide. So what? It was better than this real world around me right now. I thought jo of Joanna and what might be happening to her. The core new entry. I was writing when the cortex came close. I thought we were finished, but they didn't see us. Those huge heads turned all the time, the glittering black eyes scanning. Then they moved away. The chanting was relentless, a sing-song drone that gradually faded. We got away from there fast. I'm writing this during a short break, then we'll go on. No place to go but the goddamn desert. December 25th, 2048. Christmas. I keep thinking about fat turkey stuffed with spicy dressing, crisp cranberries, a dry white wine, thick gravy. No point in that. We found some food today in an abandoned construction site. Bread at least a week old and some dried up fruit. That was all. Ralph kept pushing me on west. He wants to see over the edge how they hold this thing together. I'm not that damned interested, but I don't know where else to go. Just running on blind fear. My professional instincts, like keeping this journal, it helps keep me sane. Assuming I still am. Ralph says putting this down might have scientific value. If I can even get it to anybody outside. So I keep on. Words, words, words. Much cleaner than this gritty, surreal world. We saw people marching in the distance, dressed in loincloths again. It suddenly struck me that I'd seen that clothing before in those marvelous wall paintings in the tombs of the Valley of the Kings. It's ancient dress. Ralph thinks he understands what's happening. There was an all-frequencies broadcast from the cortex when they tore off this wedge we're on. 
Nobody understood much. It was in that odd semi-speech of theirs, all the words blurred and placed wrong, scrambled up. Something about their mission or destiny or whatever being to enhance the best in each world. And how they'd made a deal with the Egyptians to bring forth the unrealized promise of their majestic past and so on. And that meant isolation, so the fruit of ages could flower. Ha! Huh. The world's great age begins anew, maybe. But Percy Bysshe Shelley never meant it like this. Not that I care a lot about motivations right now. I spent the day thinking of Joanna, still feeling guilty. And hiking west in the heat and dust, hiding from gangs of glassy-eyed workers when we had to. We reached the edge at sunset. It hadn't occurred to me, but it's obvious. For there to be days and nights at all means they're spinning the slab we're on. Compressing it, holding in the air, adding just the right rotation. Masters of space, time, and the river. Yes. The ground started to slope away, not like going downhill, because there was nothing pulling you down the face of it. I mean, we felt like we were walking on level ground, but overhead the sky moved as we walked. We caught up with the sunset. The sun dropped for a while in the late afternoon, then started rising again. Pretty soon it was right overhead, high noon. As we could see Earth too, farther away than yesterday. Oh, and we could see Earth too, farther away than yesterday, looking cool and blue. We came to a wall of glistening metal tubes, silvery and rippling with a frosty blue glow. I started to get woozy as we approached. Something happened to the gravity. It pulled your stomach as if you were spinning around. Finally, we couldn't get any closer. I stopped nauseated. Ralph kept on. I watched him try to walk around the metal barrier, which by then looked like luminous icebergs suspended above barren desert. He tried to walk in a straight line, he said later. I could see him veer his legs rubbery, and it looked as though he rippled and distended, stretching horizontally while some force compressed him vertically. An egg man, a plastic body swaying in the tides of gravity. Then he started stumbling, falling. He cried out, a horrible warped sound, like paper tearing for a long, long time. He fled. The sand clawed at him as he ran, strands grasping at his feet, trailing long streamers of glittering, luminous sand. But it couldn't hold him. Ralph staggered away, gasping, his eyes huge and white and terrified. We turned back. But coming away, I saw a band of men and women marching woodenly along toward the wall. They were old, most of them, and diseased. Some had been hurt. You could see the wounds. They were heading straight for the lip. Silent. Inexorable. Ralph and I followed them for a while. As they approached, they started walking up off the sand, right into the air and over to the tubes, just flying. We decided to head south. Maybe the lip is different there. Ralph says the plan he'd heard after the generals had studied the survey mission results was to try to open the shield at the ground where the Nile spills over. Then they'd get people out by boating them along the river. Could they be doing that now? We hear roaring sounds in the sky sometimes. Explosions. Ralph is ironic about it all, says he wonders when the cortex will get tired of intruders and go back to the source, all the way back. I don't know. I'm tired and worn down. Could there be a way out? Sounds impossible, but it's all we've got. Head south to the Nile's edge. We're hiding in a cave tonight. It's bitterly cold out here in the desert, and a sunburn is no help. 
I'm hungry as hell. Some Christmas. We were supposed to be back in Laguna Beach by now. God knows where Joanna is. December 26th. I got away, barely. The Cortex work in teams now. They've gridded off the desert and work across it systematically in those floating platforms. There are big tubes like cannon mounted on each end and a cortex scans it over the sands. Ralph and I crept up to the mouth of the cave we were in and watched them comb the area. They worked out from the Nile. When a muscle turned toward us, I felt an impact like a warm, moist wave smacking me in the face, like being in the ocean. It drove me to my knees. I reeled away, threw myself further back into the cramped cave. It all dropped away then, as if the wave pinned me to the ocean floor and filled my lungs with slug sluggish liquid, and in an instant was gone. I rolled over, gasping, and saw Ralph staggering into the sunlight, headed for the cortex platform. The projector was leveled at him so that it no longer struck the cave mouth, so I'd been released from its grip. I watched them lower a rope ladder. Ralph dutifully climbed up. I wanted to shout to him, try to break the hold that thing had over him, but again, the better part of valor and all that I just watched. They carried him away. I waited until twilight to move. Not having anybody to talk to makes it harder to control my fear. God, I'm hungry. Couldn't find a scrap to eat. When I took out this diary, I looked at the leather case and remembered stories of people getting so starved they'd eat their shoes. Suitably boiled and salted, of course, with a tangy sauce. Another day or two, and the idea might not seem so funny. I've got to keep moving. December 27th. Hard to write. They got me this morning. It grabs your mind. Like before. Squeezing in your head. But after a while it feels better. Feels good. But a buzzing all the time. You can't think. Picked me up while I was crossing an arroyo. Didn't have any idea they were around. A platform. Took me to some others. All Egyptians. Caught like me. Marched us to the Nile. Plenty to eat. Rested at noon. Brought Joanna to me. She is all right. Lovely in the long draping dress the cortex gave her. All around are the bird-headed ones. Ibis, I remember, the bird of the Nile. And dog-headed ones. Lion-headed ones. Gods of the old times. The Cortex are the gods of the old times. Of the great empire. We are the people. Sometimes I can think. Like now. They sent me away from the work gang on an errand. I am old not strong. They are kind. Give me easy jobs. So I came to here, where I hid this diary. Before they took my old, uncomfortable clothes, I put this little book into a crevice in the rock. Pen, too. Now, as I write, it helps. My mind clears some. I saw Ralph, then lost track of him. I worked hard after the noontime. Sun felt good. I lifted pots, carried them where the foreman said. The cortex god with ibis head is building a fresh temple. Made from the stones of Aswan. It will be cool and deep. Many pillars. They took my dirty clothes. Gave me fresh loincloth, headband, sandals. Good ones. Better than my old clothes. It is hard to remember how things were before I came here before I knew the river, its flow, how it divides the world. I will rest before I try to read what I have written in here before. The words are hard. Days later. I come back, but can read only a little. Joanna says, you should not. 
The Ibis will not like if I do. I remember I liked these words on paper in my days before. I earned my food with them. Now they are empty. Must not have been true. Do not need them anymore. Ralph. Science. All words, too. Later. Days since I find this again. I do the good work. I eat. Joanna is there in the night. Many things. I do not want to do this reading. But today, another thing howled overhead. It passed over the desert like a screaming blackbird, the falcon, and then flames. Fell. Big roar. I remembered Ralph. This book I remembered came for it. The Ibis God speaks to us each sunset of how the glory of our lives is here again. We are one people once more again, yes, after a long, long time of being lost. What the red sunset means, the place where the dead are buried in the western desert, to be taken in death close to the edge, so the dead will walk their last steps in this world to the lip and over to the nether world. There, the lion god will preserve them, make them live again. The cortex have discovered how to revive the dead of any beings. They spread this among the stars, but only to those who understand, who deserve, who bow to the great symmetry of life. One face light, one face dark. The sun lights the netherworld when for us it is night. There the dead feast and mate and laugh and live forever. Ralph saw that, the happy land below. It shares the sun. I saw Ralph today. He came to the river to see the falcon thing cry from the clouds. We all did. It fell into the river and was swallowed and will be taken to the netherworld where it flows over the edge of the world. Ralph was sorry when the falcon fell. He said it was a mistake to send it to bother us, that someone from the old dead time had sent it. Ralph works in the quarry, carving the limestone. He looks good. The sun has lain on him and made him strong and brown. I started to talk of the time we met, but he frowned. That was before we understood, he said, shook his head, so I should not speak of it. The gods know of time in the river. They know. I tire now. Again. Joanna's sick. I try to help, but no way to stop the bleeding from her. In old time, I would try to stop the stuff of life from leaving her. I would feel sorrow. I do not now. I am calm. Ibis God prepares her, works hard and good over her. She will journey tonight. Walk the last trek over the edge of the sky into the netherland. It is what the temple carving says. She will live again forever. Forever waits. I come here to find this book to enter this. I remember sometimes how it was. I did not know joy then. Joanna did not. We lived but to no point. Just come, go, come again. Now I know what comes. The Western death, the rising life. The cortex gods are right. I should forget that life. To hold on is to die. To flow forward is to live. Today I saw the Pharaoh. He came in radiant chariot, black horses before, bronze sword in hand. The sun was high above him, no shadow he cast. Big and with red skin like the Pharaoh rode down the avenue of the kings. We the one people cheered. His great head was mighty in the sun, and his many arms waved in salute to his one people. 
He is so great the horses groan and sweat to pull him. His hard gleaming body is all armor, for he will always be on guard against our enemies. Like those who fall from the sky, every day now more come down, dying fireballs to smash in the desert. All fools. Black rotting bodies. None will rise to walk with. They are only burned prey of the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh rode three times on the avenue. We threw ourselves down to attract a glance. His huge glaring eyes regarded us and we cried out, our faces wet with joy. He will speak for us in the underworld. Sing to the under gods. Make our westward walking path smooth. I fall before him. I bury this now, no more right in it. This kind of writing is not for the world now. It comes from the old dead time when I knew nothing and thought everything. I go to my eternity on the river. Yes, that was Gregory Benford of Space Time and the River. So when people, when people ask like, what is wrong with you mentally? I'd be like, I read a lot of books as a, as a kid. Just, it's this kind of stuff. I got this as a teenager. The USSR reference got me. That's funny. It's, so it's gotta be, have been written before I was born. That's all I know. Oh my goodness. The next one is out of my head. I need to get some more water. How you guys doing? R.I.P. Joanna. I know, Neiman, right? Uh, I do like, I have favorites. I do like the whole book, but I do pick favorites. That is one of them. That's one of my favorites. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, my legs are asleep. Let's do a little break before we do any more. I like how this totally doesn't match. Can you tell I just like wearing my comfortable clothes today? I did not, I did not do the stylish thing. Thanks, yeah, I really like that story. They're each individual stories um, with separate authors. Let's do a quick break. Let's do a quick little break break. Vladimir, hi from Russia. Let's do a little quick outside break. Greetings from the West Coast, the Left Coast, the fucking Stoner Coast. I'm gonna try and keep this uh, keep this in in rules and regulations, so I can't show you what I'm doing here. Rules and regulations. Oh, wow. Do I need to tighten this? There we go. Tighten her up. Tighten her up. <laughs> oh, I love that sound. Love that sound. I just want to see how my biggest tomato is going. Ooh, look at that tomato. Who's all still here with me? Who's here? You guys chilling? Are you dipping out? Hearts, 
hearts emoji. Oh, I didn't fill this up. Gotta go get something. We have to make a trek to the underworld. Trek to the underworld. I'm just in a creepy sci-fi mood, okay? We just had to read creepy sci-fi. What do we got here? <laughs> 34%. 47.48. Good night. Good night to you. what I did for my tripod there. Why do I keep forgetting things? Huh? How's it going, Shakespeare? Do you know any Shakespeare? You quote me a sonnet? Quote me a sonnet. What are you guys drinking? What are you guys smoking? Keep it PG. What do you think? One more story? Two more stories? Hey Matthew, what's up? It's taking a break, then I'm gonna get back to reading.
Thank you, Neiman. I'm good, Hama. How are you, Hamda? Okay. Let's take all these shenanigans back inside, shall we? <clears throat> better. Now I'm ready to read some more. All right. Ready for another story? Thank you, Dakota. Thank you for the likes and the subscribes. I appreciate it. All right, Out of My Head by James Gunn. I'm looking for the date of when this was put together. August 1986 was the first edition. So all of these short stories had to have been written before 1986. Roddy came out of anesthesia feeling like a hairy mammoth thawing. Lights overhead were like splinters of ice and his head felt as if it had already been stuffed for display in some natural history museum. It was stuffed, he soon realized, but with voices, angry, petulant, loud, soft, strident, whiny voices. And they were arguing. Move over. Give someone else a bit of space. Move over yourself. You're the one hogging everything. Can't we keep it down in here? We're all in this together. Why doesn't everybody just shut up? Yes, Roddy agreed. Everybody shut up. Well, I'm not going to shut up until I get my fair share. Some people are just pigs. Now it's going to be all right. The change always makes us edgy. Shut up, Grandpa. I'm the one who gets a right to complain. You, you're the one who got us into this mess. How was I to know the gun was loaded? We all told you don't fool around with another man's wife. Whoever saw a weapon like that outside a museum? He's an antiquarian, we said. He's got old-fashioned ideas, we told you. Besides which, he's always secretly hate us, we said. Hated us, we said. <clears throat> I mean, after all, this is 2093. Shut up, Roddy shouted. A passing nurse looked in, shocked. As Roddy sat up alone in his starched white hospital bed, holding his head between his hands as if they were the jaws of a vice. Nausea churned his stomach and burned the back of his throat. That's gross, a voice complained. Somebody's got to do something about this boy. What's his name? Roddy? What kind of name is that? It was his mother's idea. Kick his frontal lobe, Sam. You're the closest. Teach him to show some respect for his elders. Sam, Roddy thought confusedly, was his father's name.
we're all in this together and we've got to shut up grandpa shut up roddy screamed i can't stand it and then as the voices momentarily fell silent he said what are you all doing in there the voices be all began to speak at once it was like a tower of babel rising up through the top of roddy's skull one at a time roddy pleaded holding his head again you speak grandpa you are the oldest that's better said the voice that Roddy was beginning to identify as grandpa. A proper respect for age and wisdom is the beginning of a good relationship. Bullshit, said the voice that kept telling everybody to shut up. The voice seemed painfully familiar. You're new at this, grandpa said patiently, and you'll just have to learn patience and protocol. Now, Roddy, this first experience is difficult. A partial amnesia is not an uncommon symptom, but memory comes back fast if you let it. Remember? Roddy clutched his head and stared up at the glittering ceiling. God help him, he was beginning to remember. It should be understood that Greta was liber a liberated young woman. At the age of 15, she had her own conat, her own income, her own sense of values, and her own last name, chosen when she was 12 and changed each month since. Roddy had forgotten her patronym, if he ever knew. He had never met Greta's parents. For all he knew, she had none. Greta had her own close friends, her own circle of acquaintances, and her own way of life. Roddy understood all that. The problem, as he saw it, was that Greta was not liberated with him. For Greta was beautiful. She had blonde hair and blue eyes that opened wide when she was pleased to reveal the largest, blackest pupils. But they had never looked that way at Roddy. Instead, ever since they had met at a party, Roddy had deluged Greta with calls and letters, flowers and gifts, and all he got in return was a look from narrowed eyes that said, you're too young. You're too young, she had said that very evening. But I'm 17, he had protested, and you're 15. I'm an old 15, she said, as if stating an indisputable fact, and you're a young 17. That doesn't make sense, he said. They were standing outside her conapt door when he had half, where he had half accompanied, half followed her from the sensorium concert where they had accidentally, intentionally on his part, met. The door kept murmuring questions that Roddy did not understand because his senses were reeling in a way the sensorium had not achieved. Greta was not only beautiful, she was nubile, and Roddy's skin prickled with passion, and more than a little lust. It does to me, she said. Besides, you probably want to involve me in something serious. No, no, he protested. Nothing like that. Nothing sordid and long-term. Brief ecstasy, that's all. Well, she began. He did not know whether this was the beginning of surrender or the continuation of refusal, because it was then that a bright light dazzled his eyes and a voice that lacked not only humanity but any trace of compassion asked, Roddy Wilson? But the voice already knew the answer because it belonged to a robot waiting in the glassy street on its plastic treads for an answer that Roddy could not give. Then, in the brief confusion, the door had opened and shut and Greta was gone, and his one opportunity to be immortal, if only for a few moments, was gone with her. He turned on the robot with teenage fury. Now see what you've gone and done, he said with magnificent inarticulateness. But the robot had already identified him by telltale ID buttons and features, and an extensible arm shot out and to grab his wrist in its padded fingers. Roddy was pulled, protesting, to a seat in front of the robot's vision plate. Roddy Wilson, it said, emergency. 
See here, Roddy said, already being trundled through the lighted streets toward an unknown destination. A robot may not injure a human being or through inaction. You're not being injured, the robot said, swiveling on its treads in an intersection and heading off at right angles in a direction that seemed to lead towards a large glowing building in the distance. You have no idea, Roddy mourned. Neither did the physician. We regret the need to summon you so abruptly, it said, though it was clear that the real regret was not involved. But your father is dying. My father? And there wasn't time. Roddy hadn't seen his father for years, except, of course, for annual inspections and ceremonial occasions. He remembered his father as a tall, forbidding presence, whose face was sometimes hairy and sometimes not. Roddy preferred it, Harry, because then he couldn't see the features that he found so terrifying. But the change was frightening, too, and he could not never be sure that any bearded stranger might not be his father. His father was a wealthy and powerful man who spent his time manipulating other people, and Roddy had learned that it was better to be forgotten by such people. Finally, he realized that he had his father mixed up with God. That must have been about the time his father developed doubts. He would pause as if listening to internal voices. Roddy had stopped listening to the physician who was a different kind of robot, all clear plastic and efficient stainless steel. Now he heard the physician say, there's no hope for recovery. The cere cerebellum has suffered irreparable damage, and it is only a matter of hours, perhaps minutes, before death occurs. We can keep him alive only until transfer. Transfer, Roddy echoed. His body was found in a waste disposal chute, apparently abandoned for dead, but the sensor detected life and rejected the body. With his last conscious breath, Mr. Wilson invoked parental rights. Parental rights, Roddy said. It was all coming back to him now, the struggle with the come-along robot in the sterile white hallway, the physician's forefinger extended toward him like gods to Adam as Roddy yelled, I'm too young, I'm only 17, I've got my own life to live. And then the forefinger touched his and brought not only life, but paralysis. In a strangely detached condition that Roddy associated with death, he watched himself being disrobed, wrapped in a hospital gown, placed on a robot gurney, and rolled down that long white corridor into an operating room whose low ceiling lights were cold and bright. It doesn't hurt, you know, the physician said, looming over Roddy as he attached electrodes to his head with a sticky fluid and suction device. When Roddy's head was turned to the left, he saw another gurney beside him. On it was a man with his head wrapped in bandages, his face pale, his eyes closed, tubes leading in and out of his body, an apparatus around his chest doing his breathing for him. A moment later, Roddy recognized the face, unhairy now. It was his father, looking shrunken and ungodlike. No, Roddy protested silently. I don't want God inside me. But it was useless. He could neither speak nor move, and the process continued as inexorably as the glaciers. And when the current was turned on, it was as if the glaciers had rolled over him, turning the overhead lights into glittering ice crystals that broke into a million shards of darkness descending. Out, Roddy groaned, out of my head. Now you remember, Grandpa said, and we can't get out. We're in here for good or for bad, however you make it for yourself. Oh, stop pampering the boy, the harsh voice said. Roddy recognized it now. It was his father's voice. It was the voice of God. I didn't make this 
much fuss when it happened to me. You were 60 when it happened, Sam, Grandpa said, and there was money involved, a great deal of it. And now the boy gets it all. So what? Sam said. That's not so clear, Sam. You're a lawyer, and you ought to know that. You may have stranded us without funds. We may have to start all over because of your unorthodox departure. Another voice broke in. If you'd just taken care of the succession matter at a, an appropriate time of life, the boy would be a more suitable age. But no, you didn't want to be bothered. Now we have to suffer through adolescence again, said a fourth voice. It's all your fault, Sam. Might as well let up on that, Grandpa said. We're stuck with each other, and we'd better stick to each other. Oh, God, Sam said. I can't stand it. And let up on the boy, too, Grandpa said. He just never had a chance to get used to the idea. And I'm not going to get used to it, either, Roddy said. But he did. At least he and the voices managed to work out a method for surviving in concentration camp circumstances. He began to sort out the voices. His father, of course, of course, he recognized all too well. And Grandpa, who wasn't his grandfather or even his father's grandfather, but Roddy's great-great-grandfather, George Wilson, who had been the first member of the family to take advantage of, no, seize upon, the new Luden process for personality transference. George had persuaded his son, William, persuasion was necessary in those days, to accept the transfer or lose the considerable amount of money that George had accumulated over his lifespan of 95 years. By the time William Wilson had reached the latter part of his life, then 105, he and George, putting their heads together, so to speak, had pyramided William's inheritance into a true fortune. And William's son, John, had not been hard to persuade to accept William slash George. Of course, John at that time was almost 90 and had grown used to the domination of William slash George and the financial support that went along with it. By then, a legislature already salted with conglomerates or with those who either had ambitions to start their own successions or had been bought with the conglomerate-controlled money had regularized the laws of personality transfer to accommodate the powerful gestalts that had already transformed the nature of society and commerce. It became not only a son's duty to accept his father's personality, or a daughter her mother's, when the exigencies of life called upon him to do so, but his father's inherited personalities as well. One result was an upsurge in psychosis. And the practice of psychiatry soared. This was only a problem for production controllers, however, since psychiatry had become entirely computerized. The treatment of multiple personalities improved markedly. Philosophers developed an ethics of transfer and an ethics of personality relationships. <clears throat> One of their principles was that transferred personalities could advise but not compel. Drugs had been developed to discipline unruly guest personalities with a final weapon, electroshock, held in reserve for the worst offenders. Some psychologists speculated that schizophrenia and multiple personalities, and perhaps even possession, had been no more than natural processes mechanized by Luden's electronic apparatus. Some stubborn holdouts, including a number of human lawyers, insisted that the entire concept was a hoax, in spite of feats of recall inevitably flawed by time and sometimes senility. For that reason, many conglomerates contained at least one lawyer. Sam, Roddy's father, was the Wilson's legal representative. All of this had been part of Roddy's ambient world since his birth, but like all young people, he had never related it to himself. Personality transfer, like old age, was for people like his father, who had already lived their lives. Roddy was only in the process of discovering what it was all about. The Wilson Corporation lawyer was a silky smooth man who wore a conservative one-piece blue suit. 
On its surface, it had random electric patterns in a lighter blue that kept shifting hypnotically as Roddy watched them. The lawyer's name was Fred Luendosta, and he had requested an appointment to discuss the settlement of Roddy's father's estate. Roddy sat uneasily in the bobbing chair behind the broad, shining, uncluttered desk, watching the shifting patterns, while Luendoska said smoothly, Your father's will leaves the corporations and all its assets to you, his only son. Having first made a settlement on his former wife and her heirs, if, Luendoska paused for emphasis, the Ludon process has been consummated. The son of a bitch doesn't dare deny the existence of the will, Sam said bitterly, since other copies exist. Wait a minute, Grandpa said. Fred is up to something. Unfortunately, Luendoska continued, your father died suddenly and unexpectedly, so there is some question about your rights of inheritance. Well, Roddy began, shifting uneasily in the penthouse office of the Wilson Tower with its panoramic view of the Flint Hills. He had not yet managed to get the hang of the magnetically supported chair, and it was <clears throat> threatened to pitch him out onto the floor. Wait a minute, Grandpa said. Maybe he doesn't really know whether transfer was completed, and he's trying to goad us into telling him. The son of a bitch, Sam said. Of course, Luendoska said silkily. The best tactic might to be maintain that a last-minute transfer did occur. Aha, said Grandpa. The son of a bitch, said Sam. But, Roddy began, and let whoever wishes to contest the will prove otherwise, Luendoska finished. But, Roddy began again, and was surprised to find himself uninterrupted. Transfer did occur. Luendoska smiled. You're a very bright young man, and I'm sure you will be a match for any vicious cross-examiner. Meanwhile, I trust that you will allow Luendoska slash Luendoska slash Luendoska to represent you as we did your father for so many years and his father before him. Son of a bitch, Sam said. Watch him. He's a crook. But don't watch those patterns, Grandpa said. That's his watch-my-patterns-not-my-eyes suit that he uses on susceptible juries. If you knew he was a crook, John said, why did you keep him on? He was my crook, Sam said. How can I think, Roddy said, screwing up his face. What did you say, Luendoska asked? What do you think, Roddy asked? It would be better, of course, Luendoska said, if transfer of assets had occurred before uh, transfer of personalities, as is customary in such situations. But since death was accidental, I think the course you have chosen is the wise one. If you need any coaching, coaching, Roddy said. I mean, of course, therapy, Luendoska said smoothly. I will be happy to recommend people with whom we have had good success in the past. Sometimes interrogation of memories can, uh, oh, sometimes integration of memories can be a problem. The son of a bitch, Sam said. If you will just sign these papers, Luendoska said casually, coming around the corner of the shining desk to put down a sheaf open to the last page, I won't file the will for probate. Don't sign anything, Sam said. Tell him to leave the papers and you'll call him when they're ready, Grandpa said. Paperwork is so boring, William said. Can't we go have some fun? All you want to do is get drunk so you won't have to listen to Grandpa, John said, and the rest of us hate getting drunk. Roddy noted that. Maybe he could work something out with William. Not on your life, John said. Not Willie, Grandpa said. Just sign the papers, Luendoska said. The sooner you sign, the sooner you can start enjoying your fortune. How soon, Roddy asked, reaching for the stylus. Luendoska, Luendoska, and Luendoska could advance you, say, a million against the successful probate of your father's will. Don't sign anything, Grandpa said. You'll regret it. We'll all regret it, John said. All the money we've worked for into that slimy character's pocket. Can't you see he's trying to cheat you? That son of a bitch. But Roddy was tired of listening to the voices in his head. Maybe if he had a million, Greta would take him seriously. He picked up the stylus defiantly and poised it above the dotted line before it fell from his sudden limp fingers. That's illegal, he protested. 
No, no, Lewandowska said. Perhaps I got hold of the wrong paper. You'll never prove a thing, Grandpa said. Fred clearly is recording this whole interview. But if it is ever presented in court, it will be cleverly and illegally edited. As Lewandowska whisked the papers away, Roddy caught a glimpse of the title on the top. It read, Power of Attorney. Well, Lewandowska said, as your father's attorney of record, I can simply proceed to file the will for probate. Lewandowska, 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 Roddy said dazedly. Yes, Lewandowska said. Yes and yes. The sons of bitches, Sam said. For perhaps the first time, Roddy realized that he was in a world of conglomerates. He felt weak and afraid. Don't worry, Grandpa said. You've got us. Yes, William said, and we've been more than a match for all those bastards for the past century and a half. But why did his father keep calling Lewandowska a son of a bitch? Don't you know? asked Grandpa. He's the son of a bitch who shot me, Sam said. Whom may I announce? the door asked. Nobody, Roddy said. I don't want to see Greta. It was the first time since he had met her that he'd been able to say that. Nonsense, my boy, Grandpa said. You've got responsibilities now. First things first, said William. I thought you wanted to get drunk, Roddy said cruelly. That too. Roddy had a mental image of the moist lip of a glass against his followed by the sliding bite of alcohol across his mouth and against his palate, and a sensation of burning all the way down to his stomach, where it curled around like a cat settling down. Rod Roddy gagged. Whom may I announce, the door repeated. Go ahead, John said. We've had this discussion before, and we're all agreed. This is something you've got to take care of. Look at what happened in your case because your father neglected his responsibilities. See here, Sam said, I'm tired of being held up as a bad example to my son. It was better, Roddy thought, than not being an example at all, to being unimaginable. Son, son, Sam said sorrowfully. I didn't agree, Roddy wailed. He felt like a fool standing in front of Greta's insistent front door, holding an insane colloquy with himself and unable to tell the door who he was and what he wanted. You did, you know, Grandpa said. You said that if we quit bothering you, you'd take care of it, John said. I didn't say when, Roddy said. The realization had come to him when his uninvited guests had found the image of Greta in his memory, that their presence had changed the situation. She'll understand, Grandpa said soothingly. Things will go much smoother than you expect. And they did. Partly it was because Roddy was distracted by the voices in his head and didn't have time to get knotted up and incomprehensible. Partly it was Greta, who seemed different, who did understand. I understand, she said. My mother told me all about such things. That's better than my mother did, Roddy said, glumly, holding her warm, supple hand in his as they sat upon her living room couch. Or my father, either. It's all been a terrible shock. I'd have talked to you about it in time, boy, Sam said. I expect to do my duty when the time comes, Greta said bravely, her lovely chin pointed at the corner of the mirrored ceiling. Just think I'll have all the memories, not only of my mother, but of her mother before her and her mother and her mother before her. You're a fifth generation too? Yes, she said, and tradition is important. Kiss her, Grandpa said. Go ahead, Sam said. Kiss her. I can't, Roddy said. The thought had suddenly occurred to him that making love to Greta was going to be done with an audience. Not an audience, John said. A cheering section. What did you say, Greta asked, her blue eyes widening but her pupils tiny. 
I'm sorry, Roddy said. I'm not used to all this conversation. Well, Greta said, offended. If you don't like the way I talk, kiss her, dummy, Sam said. Quick. Roddy found himself kissing her. Later, he could not remember how it happened, but he suspected that it had not been his volition. As a consequence, the kiss was a bit clumsy at first, but it adjusted and shaped itself into something very satisfying indeed. My goodness, Greta said, opening her blue eyes even wider, pupils included. He had the feeling that it was the first time she had seen him. Kiss her again, John said. She's just getting warmed up. Roddy kissed her again. She was just getting warmed up. More than warm, Roddy thought. In fact, things got rather hot for a while, and one thing led to another. Roddy forgot his audience, and he soon found himself involved more deeply than he had imagined possible. His senses all adrift, his voice and actions taken over, it seemed by strange forces, he heard himself saying, let's get married. What? she asked indignantly. Let's get married, he repeated. I want to make you happy, he heard himself saying. You're so beautiful, so wonderful. I can't bear to think of us apart. Well, she said, I want to lay all my wealth at your feet. I want to lay the world at your feet. Well, she said more thoughtfully. Afterwards, he was silent. Finally, she said, why don't you say something? I think I've said too much already, he said. First, he had lost exclusive occupancy in his head, then of his bed. He might never be alone again. Then he looked at the reflection of himself and Greta in the overhead mirror and smiled. There were compensations. Tell her the terms, Grandpa said. They talked about contracts and living arrangements. My mother and father don't live together, you know, she said. Neither do mine. They don't get along, she continued. Neither do mine. I mean, they really don't get along, she said. It didn't seem to bother her. She seemed to Roddy not only a very attractive person, but a very sensible one as well. It was a combination he liked. Grandpa liked it, too. Everybody liked it. Roddy wondered how he had gotten so lucky. But I think we should, Greta said. Get along? Well, that too, but live together. I mean, we shouldn't run out of things to say, not with all the different people to talk to. There was that too, Roddy thought. Tell her the terms, Grandpa said again. All I ask, Roddy said, is a boy for me. And a girl for me, Greta said. She kissed him. She was a sensible person and beautiful. You handled yourself very well, too, Sam said. Thanks, Roddy said. Maybe his father wasn't such a bad sort after all. You don't have to thank me, Greta said, but I like it. He pulled her close to him. It was his own idea, and it was a good one. The door announced, your father is calling, but it was too late. The door shattered with a dying gurgle, and a man lunged into the room. He was waving an old-fashioned pistol wildly in the air. Son of a bitch, Sam said. It's happening again. What's going on here, the intruder shouted, pointing the gun at Roddy. The man was Lewandowska. It was an old-fashioned courtroom done in stainless steel and clear plastic with an old-fashioned judge. He was a white-haired robot with a face that looked as if Solomon himself had sat for it. In front of the bench and to the left, judge's left sat Roddy. To the right sat Lewandowska and Greta. There was no space for an audience, but cameras made it possible for the interested or the simply curious to watch from their own living rooms. The judge turned to Lewandowska. What is the reason for your presence here? As a lawyer for the Wilson Corporation, Lewandowska began smoothly. He's not my lawyer, Roddy said, but it was Sam who spoke. I am here to represent the interests of the corporation's employees in case the will shall be held invalid. Ha, said Sam through Roddy's mouth. 
In addition, Lewandowska said, I am here representing my daughter, who has an interest in the Wilson estate, since she is clearly a minor. Ha, said Roddy. That was why, he realized now, Lewandowska had burst in on them. Perhaps he had even been spying on them. Roddy had always been suspicious of that mirrored ceiling. Perhaps it was why Lewandowska had burst in on his wife and Sam, not in an old-fashioned defense of honor, but as a calloused attack on the Wilson family fortune. Waving his gun, he had persuaded Roddy to sign a marriage contract giving Greta community property rights before the wedding. And then he had forbidden the marriage. Roddy looked wistfully at Greta, and Greta looked wistfully at him. The son of a bitch can't lose, Sam said. If we lose, he controls the corporation, and if we win, he controls half its assets. The world had closed in upon Roddy like a pack of wolves, led by Lewandowska, nipping at his corporate flanks, eager to pull down the crippled giant. Roddy was served with writs and subpoenas until he could scarcely see over the desk that he had been so efficiently and proudly bare, that had been so efficiently and proudly bare. At least we'll have each other, he had said. Don't be stupid, Sam had said. What good is mere existence, John had asked, without even a host when the time comes, Wilson, William had added. Greta wouldn't desert me, Roddy had said. But a rising inflection revealed his lack of confidence. Did he really know Greta? All he knew was that at times their interests coincided. Without money, Sam had said, Greta is an un unobtainable as she was before we joined you. Without money, John had said, even succession is doubtful. Without money, William had added, life can be more pain than joy. Now, now, Grandpa had said, let's not be hard on the boy. He's doing his best for us, right? Greta's not the problem. It's her father. And we're responsible for Fred. So let's dig in. Roddy had found his hands reaching for documents, his eyes scanning unfamiliar words, his fingers writing alien memoranda, his voice barking strange words into stranger orifices. He even began remembering events he had never experienced as his forefathers' memories began leaking into his. It was all too complicated for Roddy, but not for his new tenants. They enjoyed the struggle for its own sake and made the inside of his head untenable. He could only tune them out with thoughts of Greta, and so he had arrived, without being aware of it, in the courtroom. The legal business went on without him. Lewandowska talked, and then Sam talked through Roddy, Grandpa prompted Sam occasionally, and William and John provided an infrequent nudge. Roddy, when he could, looked at Greta and wondered idly what she would look like in five years or twenty. Lewandowska brought in a psychiatrist as an expert witness on the Ludon transfer. Sam cross-examined it ruthlessly. Sam brought in an expert witness for the Wilson Gestalt and it was ruthlessly cross-examined by Lewandowska. Lewandowska brought in half a dozen of Sam's former colleagues and so-called friends to testify that they had brought up certain matters to which Roddy had been unable to respond, and Sam brought in former colleagues and friends to testify that they were confident that Sam and his guest personalities were all faithfully ensconced in Roddy's skull. Sam called his final witness the robot physician who had presided at the Ludon transfer. I object, Lewandowska said. On what grounds, the judge asked. A machine can testify on matters of fact, but not on matters of opinion, and whether Ludon transfer was complete is a matter of opinion. It is a matter, the judge said, that will be a fact as soon as I reach an opinion. But in the end, it was only fact allowed into the record but in the end, the only fact allowed into the record was that Sam was alive when transfer was attempted. It is clear, the judge said, that we will not be able to reach a verdict today. We will take the matter under advisement. He was not using the royal we. All the precedents, all the statutes, all the opinions ever delivered were recorded in the computer files to which he had access. 
Your honor, Sam said through Roddy, justice delayed is justice deferred, especially in this instance. Luandoska had won. Collectively, they hated the silky smile on his face. He must have outbid us for the judge, Grandpa complained. Greta's mother, Roddy said. Did you say something? The judge asked. Greta's mother, Roddy repeated. Greta has a mother. Of course she has, the judge said. Every human has a mother. What our junior colleague is saying, Sam said as smoothly as Lewandowska could have done it, is that we wish to call Greta's mother as a witness. It took an hour before Greta's mother was located and brought to the courtroom. She was at least as beautiful as her daughter, and Roddy felt a bit of Sam's passion for her. I will give my consent to my daughter's marriage to Mr. Wilson, she said. I object, said Lewandowska, no longer so smooth. Since the person in question is a female, the judge said, the mother has jurisdiction. Objection overruled. I appeal, Lewandowska said, looking ruffled. The judgment of the lower court is affirmed, the judge said promptly. He contained his own appeal process. There's nothing like an honest judge, Grandpa said. Events in this courtroom, the judge said, have also demonstrated that the Ludon transfer have indeed been affected, and I therefore hold that Roderick Wilson is the legal heir to the Wilson estate. I, Lewandowska began. What's more, Sam said, I accuse this man of murder. He pointed Roddy's finger dramatically at Lewandowska. You can't prove a thing, Lewandowska said. And I will call as a witness, Mrs. Lewandowska. Sam continued inexorably. Everything would have been lost without you, Sam said, as Roddy clasped Greta to him in the corridor outside the courtroom. They made a friendly little group, Greta, Greta's mother, and Roddy and his ten tenant personalities. Tenant personalities. You're going to be a great addition to the Wilson family, Sam said fondly. For the first time, Roddy felt like a son. It felt good. In fact, everything felt good. Greta felt good. His head felt good. Everything felt so good, he began to wonder what could go wrong. Until he realized he felt a certain atavistic yearning for Greta's mother. The end. <laughs> the perfect setup, almost. What do you think of that one? Turns out Greta's mother's the problem, huh? But then, well, and then Greta's mother's going to end up in Greta's head, and then it'll be fine by that point. So if, if Greta's mother dies and does the transfer, then it'll actually, it'll be kosher at that point, right? <laughs> Friggin' minors. Oh my god. Out of my head by James Gunn. I don't know. I don't think I've read any of his other work. <clears throat> I feel like I'm kind of losing my voice. I don't know if I can do another uh, long one. This next one, A Work of Art by James Blish, is a really long one. So I might have to put that off. Into That Good Night, James Stevens. So perhaps we'll have to do those next weekend. I really wanted to read Wood. Oh, Prometheus Ghost by Chet Williamson. That's pretty good. I like, you know, fun stuff. We already read Small Change by Ursula. That it, I mean, that one is short. See, I read that one first and it is like one of the shortest stories in there. And it had the most impact on me. Um, and that's why, that's why I had to read it first. Dust by Mona Klee. Oh yeah, I love this one. How long is this? 
I actually <clears throat> didn't realize that, um, you know, that the stuff about Egypt, they actually did their research. So even though they, they put them like in the future settings and stuff, and this, this one I just mentioned the name of is set in ancient Ur, they did their research. So it's not completely based on nothing. Like it sounds like wild, like when Egypt is like lifted up and the Nile is like in space and then there really is a Nile underneath. And so like, it wasn't that the ancient religion was wrong. They were just talking about a time from when they were in space <clears throat> and then they just landed it on earth. Right. Or something like that. Or maybe they knew about the future when they would go up into space, who knows, but that is like the mythology come to life with aliens. Um, and so a lot of the sci-fi authors i i just think they're probably history nerds and i never knew that i didn't know ursula kaligan did the version of uh and her own english version of the Tao Te Ching. that like i just found that a few years ago it took me so long oh, five five six years ago now i was like what how long has this existed and a lot of people said that after i read it the other day like, why didn't I know about this? It was written in the late 90s. Why didn't I know about this? So, yeah, they really kind of, it trickles down into the stories, even if you think you're reading fiction, especially sci-fi, I think. Fantasy a little bit here and there. When you get into, like, that Harry Potter shit, that none of that is based on any, like, real mythology. That is, like, someone fucking half remembered it when they were drunk and just decided to put racism in in elf form you know like that's that's not what i call good fiction i'm sorry you know if you like that stuff but um there are actually good fiction stories out there that have like coherent world systems and magic systems or science systems or like i don't know it's just wild I love it. Aliens. Oh. <clears throat> I've been reading so much about space lately that I think that's the other thing that made me want to read these stories. Afterlife. Afterlife ideas from sci-fi authors right that's where you get the combination and i don't know why we don't see more of that combination like as a collection oh that's funny okay okay i think this was originally in the magazine. Check this out. Can you guys read this? Nineteen eighty-three. It must have been in the magazines. Honestly, I used to go through my dad's old magazines. I wonder, and I really did read it for the articles. Okay, there's comics and articles in the in dad's magazines right there's also pretty ladies but i like the articles and i don't remember if i did read any sci-fi stories there but i would have if they were there like i don't remember i remember some cartoons and stuff and some pretty ladies <laughs> that's what i need to do i need i need my own magazine with um, sci-fi stories and pretty ladies not wearing clothes, right? Like the old school, like dad's old school magazines and comics. Yeah, there's like, there's a lot going on where 
you kind of can't separate the art from the artist in some cases. Like you kind of have to look at the authors, like at least the authors who seem to live good lives and aren't dragging uh, people around in the mud should be given a little more honor and hopefully more money, although it never turns out that way than the haters. I would like it if we live in a world where we gave like good people more income than terrible people. That would be nice. Let's work on that. A sci-fi story where people aren't corrupt and messed up. I like the robots in that last story too. Like, oh, everything was like robots. This is unhinged. I found this the other day. <clears throat> I don't know how you pronounce that title. But if you go... Okay, I think it's time for me to make some dinner. I've got some videos to film tonight. I've got some customs. I've got like a James Bond outfit dance theme thing going. Um, three songs and a theme, $50. So contact me on um, email or Instagram if you actually if you want something like that if you want to pick my outfit dress me up like Barbie pick three songs and pick a theme The theme for this one is James Bond and the outfit is the doctor And the three songs are pretty good Shout out to Dave for that idea three songs I'm good, but I'm about to go make dinner. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the subscribes. It's been almost three hours. Oh my goodness, I lost track of time. Thank you for everybody that popped in and stayed and hung out and everybody that watches in the future. Thank you, Matthew, moderating. Bye-bye.